once fearsome communist power was no more. When I think about the fate of socialism, and when I think about the fate of socialism in other countries where it still supposedly exists, for example China, I always remember this 1980s experience in, in Russia. You go to a small corner, very quiet, and whisper there, freedom. And suddenly it echoes all over the place, freedom, 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 and you can't stop, it's like an avalanche. That's my impression of, the, of this era. With the fall of the Soviet Union, the era of totalitarian socialism effectively came to a close. But did the collapse of communism mean the end of socialism? The fall of communism at the end of the 1980s celebrated at the time as a great victory for the right and for capitalism and for a defeat for socialism. Actually, I believe, for socialism in the West was a huge liberating moment because from that time you were free of that contamination. You were free of that guilt by association. You had to be taken on your own terms and that deprived the right of a major chunk of its armory. Social democratic parties were making a comeback across Europe. By the late 1990s they governed 12 of the 15 states in the European Union. But many of these parties looked less and less like the socialists of the past. I do hereby declare that Anthony Charles Linton Blair has been duly elected... The most daring revisionist was Britain Tony Blair, who led the Labour Party to victory in 1997 with a landslide vote. The party as Blair recreated it is a far cry from the party of Atlas. We always said that if we had the courage to change, then we could do it, and we did it. What we wanted more than anything else was to be back in government. And it seemed that Tony Blair would do that by making what amounted to a clean start. Many Labour Party people did not realise how much of social democracy he intended to ban them. Tony Blair was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, and spent most of his childhood in Northern England. His father was active in politics, starting as a communist and ending up as a conservative. A one-time frontman for a band called The Ugly Rumors, Tony himself came to politics only at the end of his college years. He was a rebel, but he was quite a careful rebel. But there was also a much quieter side to him. I mean, he became a confirmed Christian at, uh, at Oxford University um, with a passionate belief in, um, in social justice and left-wing political uh, values. Blair won his first parliament seat in 1983. He was just 30 years old. But he was bucking the national tide. Margaret Hilda Thatcher, Conservative Party... Labour's fortunes were near the lowest point ever. 616. And the party ticket was trounced by the Conservatives. There was this sense that the different traditions that made up the Labour Party had been tried, failed, and that tradition therefore exhausted itself. So people like Blair, in a sense, had reason to think that they should remake the party from top to bottom. 57%. For John In 1994, Labour leader John Smith died of a heart attack. I therefore declare that Tony Blair is elected leader of Labour. The party turned to Blair. This man, our new leader, has got what it takes. He commands moral authority and political respect. He has the energy and vitality to win people over to Labour and he scares the life out of the Tories. <laughs> and me. Oh, it was a very exciting time, and uh, it was a uh, crusading sort of uh, zeal to him and uh, the key advisors around him, which was very exciting, but it was also uh, worrying at times in terms of his ability to take the party with him at all times. I think that was best captured by the day that Tony Blair 
somewhat delphically announced to the Labour Party conference that he was prepared to embark on a review of the Constitution, or as he called it, our aims and values. Let us say what we mean and mean what we say. Stop saying what we don't mean and start saying what we do mean, what we stand by, what we stand for. The words may have been cryptic, but everyone in the Labour Party knew what Blair was talking about. Clause 4, the part of the Labour Party's charter that committed it to common ownership. Blair wanted to make clear to voters that the party no longer believed in this kind of socialism. It is not the socialism of Marx or state control. We are the party of the individual because we are the party of community. It is socialism. But Clausefer had been around since 1918, and many in the Labour Party were not willing to give it up without a fight. Clause 4 is a totemic thing. It's an icon. And people don't like those things being fiddled around with. It's like trying to change the, the prayer book in the Church of England. It causes all kinds of controversy. The following year, Labour delegates gathered at Methodist Central Hall in Westminster, where the original Clause 4 was adopted 77 years before to vote on Blair's new language. For the new Clause 4, 65.23% against 34... 65 percent were in favor. When Blair convinced the party to do away with the traditional socialist language of Clause 4, what was in its place was pure double talk. Uh, and you can read it over and over again without <laughs> figuring out exactly what it's saying. But the meaning of that double talk became clear in action when Blair then started running for a prime minister and leading the Labour Party in a new campaign. And the policies that he was advocating in the campaign were anything but socialist policies. Now, what do you think, then, the relationship should be between the trade union and the Labour government? Fairness, not favours. We're also putting forward proposals as to how we can involve the private sector as well as the public sector. It is a welfare-to-work budget. What seemed to be essential for Tony Blair and New Labour was to create the impression of being a safe pair of hands. And the approach really boils down to several things. First, distancing the Labour Party from the trade unions. Second, appealing to middle-class swing voters who otherwise were voting conservatives. And finally, and most generally, making peace with the business world, with the British markets and with capitalism. Even those business people that aren't supporting Labour now know they've got a Labour Party that supports enterprise, that supports business. As the 1997 general election approached, Blair's strategy seemed to be working. By the evening of May the 2nd, 1997, the votes had been counted. Labour rolled to its largest win ever, even topping Attlee's record victory in 1945. All over this country, there were people that were crying out for a sensible, mainstream, moderate alternative to the Conservative Party. Today, enough of talking. It is time now to do. Thank you. Blair easily won re-election in 2001. But his policies led many to wonder whether the Labour Party was still a socialist party. Yeah, the Labour Party is a socialist party. The only problem is these days we're not so sure what socialism is. Um, it's a socialist party in the sense that it stands for a conception of society and community and people owing obligations to each other and stands for what I said was that core belief about giving everybody in society access to things that that society can offer. That, I think, is the core idea. And I think if you look at many of the programs that we're engaged in, you can still define them by that core idea. The Prime Minister would say that New Labour was a redefinition of socialism. Um, I believe it's a rejection of socialism. I believe that many things in the Labour Party's policy needed to change to meet the demands of the modern world but I thought we ought to hold tight to our basic principles and see how those basic principles could be applied in the modern world. The Prime Minister's abandoned the basic principles. Hey, how are you feeling, sir? Yeah. 
Socialist or not, Blair's approach was catching on. Eventually, as many as 14 social democratic heads of state from Europe, South Africa, and New Zealand embraced similar policies. As they talked about the importance of inclusion and a social safety net, they increasingly acknowledged the necessity for capitalism. The triumph of free enterprise was the theme at the first annual capitalist ball in Brussels. Revelers from around the world gathered on the floor of the Belgian Stock Exchange to celebrate capitalism. The day before the ball, some of the people here got together to look at the future of socialism. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, comrades, oh no, that's sorry, you're the wrong audience for, uh, uh, for that. Um, the conclusion was anything but an obituary. Socialism will not die, but it will surely change into something else. And I would argue that today socialism after the failed experiment of the Soviet Union has gone back to, its, to some of its 9th century features uh, as an anti-establishment. I don't believe that socialism is dead because I don't believe that the impulse which drives people towards the left, the desire to control, meddle and interfere in other people's lives, can ever die. Liberty is always under threat, and socialism is one of those threats. And yet there's something dynamic and moral in the heart of socialism as well. Um, it's that ambiguity that uh, keeps the uh, thing alive, and it makes it always a, a danger. At the 21st Annual Socialist Scholars Conference in New York City, a very different view prevailed. Uh, we think that the, the, the break of the Soviet Union and the, the, the fall of the wall uh, affected all the left. Social Democrats, because they, they lose some reference to, to, to build a, some model of regulation. You don't go from what you've got to what you desire like that. You have to win a series of changes. It's a mistake to equate the failure of particular socialist parties and regimes with the failure of socialism or the end of socialist values or vision. Uh, they're a reflection of the fact that they were trying to build institutions at a certain point of time in a certain part of the world. And it was to be expected, given the dynamism and power of capitalism as a system, that the first attempts to build institutions to overthrow it would not be the perfect ones. And I'm sure that we'll see over the course of the next century Loads of attempts to build new ones, new parties, new unions, new movements that will be socialist in their fundamental essence, that will learn from the mistakes of the past. A non-reformist reform is to fight for these kinds of changes and many others in a manner which leaves us when we win not going home but desiring more. Many at the conference said the anti-globalization and anti-war movements may hold the seeds of socialism's future. But some believe the idea might not always go by the same name. A lot of people, when they hear that label, they immediately reject it. Oh, socialism, I've been taught that that's wrong. So I, I don't necessarily feel the need to use that label. I mean, I, I like the term economic democracy. I think that's a fantastic term because I think that's the way people can start to think about it. We need to start extending democracy to the sphere of economics.